Filmmaking at its raw core is really just pointing a camera at something and using a combination of all of the somethings you capture to tell a story. However, it's no secret that a good filmmaker or cinematographer can blend the story being told with creative visuals in order to help emphasize the emotional state a character is in or make the audience feel exactly how they should while watching a scene unfold. Even though I find myself consciously noticing the techniques they used in some cases, the goal of a filmmaker is to use these strategies in a seamless way so the audience isn't taken out of the story to think about what just happened, but rather further immersed in it. This allows a filmmaker to say a lot more than what is literally happening in any given scene. There are many established techniques used often in films, but there is always room to get creative and develop new ways to tell a story visually. That said, I wanted to talk about some of my favorite uses of cinematic techniques as visual cues in storytelling, analyze their effect in different scenes, and attempt to explain why I think these techniques help drive the story they're helping to tell. Composition is the most basic building block of visual storytelling. Every shot in a film has composition, effective or ineffective. Even if it's not creative, effective composition helps make your story flow well and be less confusing. For example, you've probably heard of the 180 degree rule which argues that you shouldn't cross an imaginary straight line in your scene as it creates visual confusion about the blocking of a scene. Or maybe you've heard about giving a character lead room in the direction they're facing in order to give the viewer a clear sense of direction. Though composition can help guide your story, it can do a lot more than make it easy to follow. Composition can also be expressive, help to set the tone of a scene, and evoke a feeling the storyteller is trying to convey. This is where an understanding of different elements of composition come into play. Take balance, for example. There are two main types of balance in cinematography, symmetrical and asymmetrical. Symmetrical balance can make two characters seem like they're a good pair, or compare one side with another, or even be used to make you feel a certain way. I find symmetrical balance is often best used by Wes Anderson and Stanley Kubrick. Although the main difference between the two is that Anderson uses it for a comedic effect and Kubrick uses it to invoke fear. For example, Wes Anderson often allows shots to unfold from the center of the frame, not only to direct your attention there, but also contrast what is happening with the organization of the shot. This often feels absurd in the context of a scene, but that's exactly what makes it funny. In contrast, this infamous shot from Stanley Kubrick's The Shining uses symmetry to create a feeling of unease instead, as Danny playfully cruises around the Overlook Hotel before pedaling up to the disturbing, creepy twins. Hello, Danny. Come play with us. That uneasy feeling isn't always conveyed through symmetry, though. It can also be done through asymmetry, the show Mr. Robot is well known for using this type of composition and framing to build tension or make the audience feel trapped like Elliot does. Take this scene for instance, where the lead room role I was talking about earlier is completely and utterly broken. This is an instance where it's actually okay to break the rules of composition in order to convey a meaning. What's the meaning here though? It's easy to say that like the rest of the show, the purpose is to unsettle the viewer as much as Elliot is. What better way to convey the confusion and distraught lives of the characters than by framing those lives in the same manner? Another theory from Karsten Runkist suggests that the purpose is to include society as a character in the show, 
After all, society does play a big role in what the show is about. The lack of symmetry isn't always as dramatic as it is in Mr. Robot, though. Asymmetry can also just be used to make a comparison. Let's look at this shot from Disco Pigs. The asymmetrical shot of Baby Runt with an empty cradle right next to her follows up her voiceover to tell the audience that another family member is being added without her needing to say a single word. And for the one and only time, we three are a family. It also helps highlight the downfall of Pig and Runt's relationship throughout the film, as this shot of Runt as a newborn is the last bit of asymmetry we get in the relationship until nearly 17 years later, when it starts to fall apart. Let's look at another example. This shot from 12 Years a Slave is also asymmetrical. Solomon is placed on the right side of the frame, and the camera is positioned so we watch from a distance, emphasizing his helplessness in this scene, and heightening how disturbing the whole situation is as we see everyone continue as normal in the background. He's isolated and alone. Even after he's brought water, we cut to a similar shot from behind him, and we're back to isolation. Composition can also represent a power dynamic. Just as symmetry may represent two equals, you can use scale or proportion to emphasize inequality between two characters. It's not always a power dynamic between two people, though. Sometimes your setting can be a character, an environment or feeling the protagonist must overcome. For example, the Lord of the Rings films often use high, wide angles, in part because New Zealand is beautiful, but also to make the characters feel small in comparison to their large surroundings. This emphasizes the scope of the hero's journey. On the opposite side of that, there's this shot from Fellowship of the Ring. Here, this shot makes the ring the biggest thing in the frame. They played with perspective quite a bit in these films, but in this shot we really feel the importance of such a small object before Boromir picks it up and highlights that even further. Boromir, it is a strange fate that we should suffer so much fear and doubt over so small a thing. One of the last compositional elements I wanted to touch on is focus, or emphasis. It's important for a cinematographer to carefully consider where the viewer's eyes should be guided in any single shot. There are many ways to draw attention to an area of the frame. You can use leading lines, frames within frames. You can rack focus from one subject to another. Racking focus can also be used as your subject changes their distance from the camera. Outside of putting attention on a subject, these different strategies to focusing can also express meaning. For example, this shot from Breaking Bad shows Jesse looking down the barrel of a gun. The shot starts focused on his expression and what he's feeling as he holds it. Please, don't do this. You don't, you. All the manipulation and harm Walter's done to him over the course of the show thus far. You don't have to do this. Before shifting to the gun itself and reminding us of the seriousness of the weapon he holds just before he pulls the trigger. The shot simultaneously reminds us of what this means for Jesse's character when he does so. As he fades out of focus, the old Jesse does as well. This same shot also uses proportion to not only emphasize the gun, but exaggerate the importance of it in the scene, as it is the largest thing in the frame from this perspective. We also see balance at use here, as the shot starts as an over the shoulder of this intense conversation, and as the shot orbits into symmetry on Jesse, he and the gun align both physically in the frame and figuratively as he shoots Gale, crossing the line you can't come back from. Mixing compositional elements together can help get multiple points across, or help emphasize something even more. If the shot stayed where it was and just changed the focus to the gun, the scene would be significantly less impactful. Keep that in mind as we move on to camera movement. As you'll see, it's often a combination of visual techniques that really propel a story. While composition plays an important role in telling a story, camera movements, and even lack thereof, also help drive it forward. The camera acts as the audience's eye into the world the story takes place in, 
just as important as where you point it is where it goes. But let's start with something a little more stationary. Let's look again at this scene from 12 Years a Slave. While discussing composition, we went over how the camera framed Solomon in isolation, surrounded by nothing, and showing the others in the background. In examining camera movement, let's look at how this same scene conveys a disturbing sense of panic without any panic at all. The film spends a lot of time on Solomon's lynching here. This first shot lasts for almost a minute and a half, and it's completely static. The lack of movement helps emphasize how alone and helpless he is in this scene, focusing on barely balancing on his toes to stay alive. This long, static shot helps draw out the tension in what's happening without moving the camera at all. However, much of the time, moving the camera can say something as well. For example, camera movements can act as visual cues. When a camera pushes in on a subject, it can signify to the audience that it's important. It can also be a way to emphasize focus on something, once again going back to those elements of composition. By contrast, there's pulling out, which can be used to reveal characteristics of a scene over time, or pull the audience out of a scene both physically and figuratively. This can also showcase isolation. The further you are from your subject, the smaller they seem, and therefore less significant in a moment. Let's take a look at another movement that actually makes use of pushing in and pulling out. That movement is called the dolly, and when combined with a zoom, you get something called the dolly zoom, or zolly shot, or the vertigo effect, named after Alfred Hitchcock's use of this technique in the film Vertigo. The dolly zoom can be used one of two ways. The first is by dollying in and zooming out. Let's look at how this effect is used in the film Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Here, Ego has brainwashed Peter into helping him take over the galaxy through the use of his celestial powers, but one small revelation forces Peter to come to his senses. The dolly zoom is used here to signify Peter's internal conflict and his moment of realization that his father is actually the bad guy. The background gets pushed away from him and his eyes clear to cue the viewer that he's come out of his hypnotized state. The other way to use a dolly zoom is by dollying out and zooming in. This pulls the background closer to the subject. In this scene from Ratatouille, Remy is idolizing Gusto on the TV, and as he watches, the dolly zoom is created even in animation, and the TV grows closer to Remy to emphasize his admiration in this moment. It's this subtle trick of a lens that helps let the audience know that Remy admires Gusto and wants to be like him, and without it, it's almost just a rat on a screen, staring at another screen. One of the final aspects of cinematography that I wanted to cover is lighting and color. Lighting is a crucial element in crafting a film. It's also one of the most overlooked elements in a film. Lighting can heavily affect the tone a scene gives off. High key lighting can be good for comedies where the feeling is less drab, and dramatic or low-key lighting can work well for dramas to convey more intimidating moments. There is also surreal lighting and color that have a less natural feel, but typically a more meaningful purpose. All lighting helps set the tone of a scene, but how does lighting help drive the story? Remember that the goal isn't to just light the scene so you can see what's happening on the screen, but for that light to also make sense in the environment. One way to do that is to make the lighting a part of the story. Roger Deakins is arguably one of the best cinematographers of all time, and one of his defining attributes is his ability to practically light a scene. 1917 is a beautiful example of this. Take this scene where Schofield wakes up and stumbles back onto his journey after being knocked out. He's determined to see this through and succeed on his mission. We push into this destroyed city where the enemy is firing a flare pistol to light the sky so they can see if anyone's coming. This also lights the scene for the viewer. Schofield starts running, and we only see when the flares are shot. He even waits for a flare to die before running again at one point. Not only does this look amazing, but the lighting is an integral part of the story here. But lighting can be a part of the story without being natural. Sometimes storytelling may call for a more surreal or expressionistic approach. Lighting and color are often affected as well when going in this direction. Take the entirety of Suspiria, for example. During the day, comfortable and muted lighting and color are used to make the viewer feel the safety of daytime. But at night, things get a lot more 
unsettling. The color in these shots are overbearing. It's very unnatural and matches the unnatural horror of the world that Susie finds herself in throughout the film. The intention being to make you feel anything but comfortable, as no one calls attention to the blood red lights that haunt the scene. At the heart of composition, camera movement, lighting, and color is cinematography. The movie making art form has so many elements, and when they all align, they can leave a real impact on your audience. Because of that, cinematography is only a single piece of the very intense and stressful puzzle that is crafting a film. But with proper thought and care, a film can say so much in its runtime. As with any art, someone can take something away that isn't always intended. Some of the points I made in this video alone could even be up for interpretation. But one thing is for certain. When the effectiveness of a story beat is maximized by using elements of cinematography to help emphasize emotions or developments, that story is truly being driven by far more than what is literally happening in a scene. That's right. That's right. 